اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا ربنا به لنا وزدنا اللهم طهر قلوبنا وأزل عيوبنا وتولنا بالحسنى وزينا بالتقوى واجمع لنا خيري الآخرة والأولى ورزقنا طاعتك ما أبقيتنا يا رحمن يا رحيم اللهم أخرجنا من سلمات الرهن وأكرمنا بنور الفهم وعلمنا وزينا بالعلم وجعلنا من الذين يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم افتح علينا فتوح العارفين ووفقنا توفيق الصالحين وجعلنا من المتقربين إليه على علم وهدى وبصيرة يفتاح يا أمين وصل وسلم وبارك وأنعم على سيدنا وحبيبنا ونبينا محمد بن عبد الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أمين الحمد لله بيد نعمة of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his karam and his fadl upon us we will continue with the 40 hadith of al-imam al-nawawi rahimahullahu tabarak wa ta'ala wa nafa'ana bi'ulumihi wa bi-taqwahu wa bi-barakatihi fi al-dharayi ameen in the previous lesson we stopped at um, I think hadith number 38 or 39 um, Hadith number 38. So we'll re-read the hadith and then we'll continue from where we stopped. So Imam al-Nawawi, rahimahullah tabaraka wa ta'ala, narrated through an unbroken chain of narration to Sayyidina Abu Huraira, radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa arda, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna Allah ta'ala qala, Man aada li waliya faqad adhantuhu bil harb, Wa ma taqarraba ilayya abdi bi shay'in ahabba ilayya mimma iftaradtu alayhi, Wa ma yazalu abdi yataqarrab ilayya bin nawafil hatta uhibbah, Fa idha ahbabtuhu kuntu sam'ahu alladhi yasma'u bih, Wa basarahu alladhi yubusiru bih, ويده التي يبطش بها ورجله التي يمشي بها وإن سألني لا أعطينا ولا إن استعادني لا أعيدنا. so الإمام النووي رحمه الله تعالى نريد تو أبو هريرة رضي الله تعالى عنه who narrated that the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said that الله سبحانه وتعالى said whoever takes one of my awliya as an enemy or in different versions of the hadith whoever belittles a wali of mine or whoever harms a wali of mine then I declare war against him and this part of the hadith we uh, we've spoken about so we'll continue from there inshallah ta'ala so in the following part of the hadith the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that no one comes closer Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said no one from my servants comes close to me or closer to me than with something that I have made compulsory upon them the wajibat fara'id in Islam or, or the wajibat in Islam that which is obligatory are separated into two categories generally there are different categories from different angles but in general with re with relation to upon whom is the thing wajib there are two general categories the first is fard ain fard ain means something that is obligatory upon every single muslim who is sane and who is mature except if there is a reason that exempts them from a specific obligation. And then there is, or there are obligations that are wajib on no specific individual from the ummah. These obligations, we call them fard 
على سبيل الكفاية أو فرض الكفاية so فرض عين فرض كفاية فرض كفاية begins as being واجب on everybody who is capable that's how it starts somebody dies for example a Muslim pass, passes away four things are obligatory with regard to that deceased Muslim he must be washed, he must be shrouded, he must be buried, and salah must be prayed for him, salatul janazah. These four things are wajib. Upon whom is it wajib? Initially, upon everybody who is capable. So it's fard kifaya. This is what is meant by kifaya. Kifaya means yani yakfi wahid or yakfi adad muayyan. Yakfi means one person is enough to fulfill it or a specific number of people are enough to fulfill it, but not any specific individual. So the moment the person passes away, everybody in that community who is capable of praying now is burdened with, with those obligations. When one of them or two of them or three, and it depends on the different wajibat, but in this specific example, once one of them steps up, or two of them, or four of them, there are differences of opinion among the ulama, then the obligation is removed from everybody else. Because an, uh, an amount of people who, yani, an enough number of people have stepped up. So there are many obligations in the religion that are kifai obligations. Those also fall under the hadith that we are talking about. So when, the, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa reported, that no one draws nearer to me than with that which I have made obligatory upon them, both categories of obligations are being referred to here. So every individual must do what they are obligated to do on a daily basis. And that brings them close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then those who step up and take on the responsibilities that are obligatory on the community, they also draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by fulfilling those obligations. Among the obligations that are kifai, that are communal, include things like uh, having doctors, having engineers, having people who can take care of the things without which the community cannot function. These are also obligations in the religion. Uh, sorry, in the religion. So these are also religious obligations by Sharia. So for people to step up and take on those responsibilities, the responsibility of Islah bayna al uh, Islah yani bayna nas to uh, reconcile between people, especially in communities where there are no qudat, there are no Muslim judges. I mean, even in the Muslim countries now, access to Islamic judges are extremely difficult. And, and the system takes more out of you than it would for you to get your rights. A lot of people give up their rights because they do not have access to qadis. So in these types of communities, to step up and take that responsibility of, of, of uh, mediating between conflicting parties, and stuff like that. Yani everything necessary for the functioning of that community. These are also obligations. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that you, no one, none of the servants of his servants draw near to him with that which is yani, with something better than that which he has made obligatory upon them, both categories of obligation fall into that. And then he said, uh, وَمَا يَزَالْ عَبْدِ يَتَقَرَّبْ إِلَيَّ إِلَيَّ بِالنَّوَافِلْ حَتَّى أُحِبَّهُ And after people do that which is obligatory upon them to do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, they continue to draw near to me by doing extra ibadat. So imagine any, any, any scenario where there are people who are under your uh, jurisdiction. So you can command them or you can give them responsibilities and they need to fulfill those responsibilities. 
Imagine an employer with his employees, for example, and then all of them do what they have to do. Those who do not do what they have to do, they are in a worse position. They can even be fired, right? They can face the worst consequences. But those who do what they have to do, all of them become equal. They all do what they have to do. But then those who go beyond, those who do extra, those who do what they have to do, but they put a little more effort into it. They put a little more thing into it and it becomes better and better. They would be closer to the employer than anybody else. Any, they'll be uh, compensated for their extra. They'll be compensated for the work. But in terms of closeness, the relationship, the strength, the value that they would have to or in the sight of the employer would be higher. If it comes to a position, to a point where the employer has to let one of them go, who do you think will, will be kept? The people who go extra, who go beyond. So, I mean, there's no comparison when we're speaking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but that is the idea. We do Everybody do what they need to do, what they have to do, what they're obligated to do. And then those who go beyond the call again you know, goes beyond the obligation they put themselves in a closer position to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than those who don't but again always remember this is not necessary this is normative normative means عادتن, yani, this is the case however it is not necessary Allah azza wa jal can bring somebody close to him just because he wants to and somebody can do everything and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can, we're not saying that he would, but he, it's possible he can remove them from his mercy subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah azza wa has made it the norm that doing extra becomes sabab, becomes a normative means of attaining closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the hadith, or the hadith Qudsi, there's a clear indication not even an indication. There's a clear informing where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is informing his servants that the only path to him subhanahu wa ta'ala is a path of ta'a. This is important to understand. There are many ways, there are many in turuq among the people who claim to be the people of tasawwuf and their turuq Tariqa literally means a, a way or a path. Their way to Allah Azza wa Jal is far removed from the implementation of Sharia, far removed from the implementation of the wajibat, in fulfilling the wajibat and doing the mustahabbat. I'm not talking about all turuq, and I'm not talking about all of the people of tasawwuf, but I'm talking about some of them. These are false Sufis and these are false. You know, people making false claims, any claim of a path that will bring you to Allah Azza wa Jal that does not involve ibadah, does not involve the fulfilling of the wajibat and staying away from muharramat and does not involve the implementation of the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a false path. It is not a way to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Allah Azza wa Jal is saying in this hadith puts nothing Nothing will bring you closer to him, Azza wa Jal, than that which is wajib. And then you continue to come closer to him with that which is the nawafil al-ibadat, the extra ibadat that must be in accordance with the teachings of the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam. So this, yani this is the way to Allah Azza wa Jal. So then it continues and he says, that he will continue to draw near to me with nawafil hatta uhibbahu until I love him. What is meant by this part of the hadith is hatta uhibbahu akthar. That word akthar is mahdhuf. In the Arabic language is very common to have omissions. If, the, if what is omitted is clear. In this case, Allah Azza wa Jal the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not only attached to nawafil, but is already mentioned that you draw near to him azza wa jal by doing that which is wajib. 
That's already established. You do that which is wajib, you are close to Allah Azza wa Jal. Being close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means that you are gaining the love and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the next part of the hadith that said you continue coming close, hatta uhibbahu, until I love him, cannot mean that before doing nawafil, you're not loved by Allah Azza wa Jal. There will be no drawing nearby doing that which is wajib. So because it is obvious from what has already been mentioned that uhibbahu here doesn't mean mere loving, the part that says akthar, I would love him more, has been any hudif, any mahdhuf. It has been omitted based on the rules of uh, eloquence, fasaha in the Arabic language. So what it means is if you do what is wajib, Allah Azza wa Jal will love you. If you continue doing beyond the wajibat and you increase in your nawafil, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will love you more. And then it says, يعني حتى أحبه فإذا أحببته كنت سمعه الذي يسمع به So he will continue doing nawafil. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his love for that individual will increase. And, and, and again here theologically, we need to be careful not to interpret the word love as an emotion and not as the increase of love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, or happens due to an emotional reaction to somebody doing that which is pleasing to him. Because Allah azza wa jal does not have emotion. Emotion is a quality of created beings. The love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means the will to reward. So the more we do, the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward our actions. And the more we increase in our, our, our nawafil, the more we get from the mercies and the gifts of Allah, the givings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he said, and then, إِذَا أَحْبَبْتُهُ If the person does more and more ibadat, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love for that person increase, meaning the, the will of Allah Azza wa Jal to reward this person more and to give him more of his uh, mercies, be they physical mercies or more importantly spiritual mercies, that person becomes closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hatta kuntu sam'ahu alladhi yasma'u bihi until I become the hearing with which he hears and the sight with which he sees, and the limbs, yani the, his hands with which he acts, and his feet with which he walks. What does this mean? Obviously, it does not mean a physical becoming. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that. There is no communion with Allah azza wa in the sense of beings, becoming one with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it is logically impossible. So until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes the hearing with which he hears, etc., what it means is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him isma in his body. He will do so much nawafi after fulfilling all of the wajibat and staying away from the muharramat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a reward for him using his body and using his mind and using his heart in ibadah, Allah azza wa is going to protect that heart and protect that mind and protect that body from committing sins. So I become the only thing. And Allah azza wa becomes the only reason for the usage of that person's ears. In other words, he does not use that hearing except to hear that which is pleasing to me. He does not use his sight except to see that which is pleasing to me. He does not use his tongue except to say that which is pleasing to me. His limbs are only used in the service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I become the only reason he does what he does. And I become the only reason that he abstains from that which he abstains. So Allah Azza wa Jal grants him isma. Isma means protection from sins, not like the Anbiya. 
meaning the difference between the isma of the anbiya and the isma of the of other than the anbiya and the difference between the preservation of allah azza wa jalla the protection of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the prophets from committing sins and other than prophets from committing sins is that with the prophets it is impossible they cannot commit sins while for other than them it is they can there is still a possibility except that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes one possibility to outweigh the other meaning allah azza wa jalla causes them not to fall into sin though it is possible for them to fall into sins while the anbiya are protected from protected from falling into sins while it's being impossible for them to ever fall into sins so this is the meaning of that sentence according to some of the ulama and then according to others and and there not need not to be a separation between these different views they can all be reconciled some of the ulama say that the meaning of this is that the entire being of that person becomes a reflection of ma'rifa so until his entire body mentioning parts in the arabic language there's a type of literary device whereby we can mention a thing and refer to the entire thing mention a part of a thing but mean the entire thing that exists also in the english language for example in the english language when we say to somebody i would like to ask for your daughter's hand in marriage you're not asking to marry the hand you're asking to marry the entire woman in the same way in the arabic language there's a literary device of mentioning part of a thing but meaning the entire thing so when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam or it's a hadith qudsi so when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses these specific parts of the body it is to emphasize those parts but to refer to the entire body of that person so when a person fulfills the wajibat stays away from the muharramat and does a lot of nawafil the entire being of that person becomes a reflection of ma'rifa a reflection of somebody who is deeply aware of the existence of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has mushahada of the signs of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is so deeply conscious of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a in a perpetual way that whenever he is seen others are reminded about allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there's a hadith in which the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is reported to have said خيار عبادي من رؤوا or من إذا رؤوا ذكر الله the best of my servants are those when they are seen يعني the best of the servants sorry the best of خيار عباد الله the best of the servants of Allah سبحانه وتعالى are those when they are seen Allah سبحانه وتعالى is remembered because they become a reflection of of the remembrance of Allah azza wa jalla so this hadith according to some of the ulama this is the meaning of this part of the hadith the person becomes so engulfed so engrossed in in dhikr and in ibada fard an nafil that they cannot be seen except that they are seen in an act of ta'a in an act of ibada and because they're perpetually in 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 the acts of ibadah their their entire being whether they're looking at something or listening to something or saying something or walking to a certain place or using their limbs to do anything becomes they're always seen doing acts of ibadah so they reflect only allah so whenever they're seen the reflection of their existence of their being is Allah that I am a servant of Allah so we are always reminded by these people of Allah azza wa jalla so metaphorically the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described them as him becoming their hearing and seeing and their being because the physical meaning of that is impossible we automatically know that it is a metaphor for them be becoming engrossed in the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala
So he said there's no need to separate between these views. These can be the same thing. And this becomes a consequence of being in constant nawafil. وَإِن سَأَلَنِي لَأُعْطِيَنَّ And if they ask of me, then they shall be given. And that's the words of the hadith, and it doesn't clarify what they are given or the nature of them being given that. The assumption from the language of the hadith is that they will be given whatever they asked for, but that's not necessary. And what it could mean is they will be given whatever they asked for in the dunya, as long as it fulfills the general rules of dua. So it's not something haram, uh, it's not something normatively impossible, it is not something logically impossible, and so on. So they, it means that they will be given whatever they ask in this world. Or it means that whatever they ask for, they will be given better than it in this world. Or it can mean whatever they ask for, they will be given double of it in the akhirah. Or they will be given an equivalent of it in the akhirah. But the idea is they become the, 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 the meaning of those different views, those different interpretations converge on one point, and that is they become mustajab da'wah. They become people whose da'wah, whose dua, whose supplications are normally accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the effects of it show up immediately in the dunya. You need the effects, not necessarily the thing asked for, but the ethar of, of making dua shows up in the dunya. And if they seek my protection, I shall grant that to them. Rawahu al-Bukhari. And this hadith was reported or collected by Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala in his sahih. We'll move to the next hadith insha'Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hadith number 39. So Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullah tabaraka wa ta'ala wa nafa'anna bi narrated through an unbroken chain of narration to the authority of Ibn Abbas radiyallahu ta'ala anhuma anna rasulallahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said inna allaha tajawaza li an ummati al-khata'a wa nisyana wa mastukrihu alayhi hadith hasan rawahu ibn maja wal bayhaqiyu wa ghayruhuma so Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullah ta'ala narrated through an unbroken chain to Sayyiduna ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has tajawaza li an ummati tajawaza li Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of me would tajawaz means to pardon, to, to forgive, to overlook, to not take someone to task. So because of me, or for me, yani, li, tajawaza, li, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi said, that this is from the barakah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa This is from the givings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa So it's one of those gifts of Allah azza wa jal, to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where the gift doesn't relate to him Alayhi Salatu Wasallam or the, the, the benefactors of the gift is not the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was so concerned for his Ummah that anything that relieves from them a burden is a gift to him Azizun Alayhi Ma Anittum Harisun Alaykum the, the Prophet وسلم, was deeply concerned for you. Harisun alaykum, yani he was all of his concern was his concern was for you. Azizun alayhi ma anittum. Anything that harms the ummah was dear. It it hurt him. So a gift. 
to him that he's not the one benefiting from in the sense of directly. He gets the relief of something that is being lifted from his ummah, but the gift to him is relief for his ummah. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Sayyidina Muhammad. So because of him, as a blessing to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has lifted from his ummah. Al-khata wa nisyan. Something done mistakenly or something done forgetfully. Al-khata wa nisyan, the mistakes and for any mistakes and doing committing sins forgetfully fall into two broad categories. The first is that which was not caused by negligence. Yani where the forgetting or the mistake is not a result of negligence. And where the mistake is a result of negligence or the cause for the mistake is a result of negligence and the cause for forgetting is due directly to negligence. The first category is what this hadith refers to. The ummah of the Prophet ﷺ, individuals in the ummah of the Prophet ﷺ are not taken to task for things that they've done mistakenly or forgetfully when that mistake is not a result of negligence and when forgetting is not a result of negligence. But if the mistake or forgetting is a result of negligence, then one is responsible for the, for the subsequent act because one is responsible for the cause. So it has to be a direct relationship. So for example, if the time for salah enters, and one is not occupied with anything that has to do with their responsibilities of dunya or of akhirah, and they chose to delay the prayer, and they then, after knowing that the time of salah has entered, in a state where they're not occupied by any of the responsibilities of dunya and the akhirah, they made a conscious choice. Now I shall go play video games. They got caught up in the video games or they got caught up in playing or something like that with their friends. And in the enjoyment, they, got, they lose track of time and the time of the prayer exits and they did not pray. That is not something that is lifted from them. So the prayer was not done as a result of forgetting. But forgetting was a direct consequence of a choice that is regarded as negligent according to Sharia. Because once you remembered, you should have prayed. You, you are not occupied with anything Anything that is from the responsibilities of dunya and the akhirah, you should have prayed. If you chose not to pray and to delay the prayer, then you should have set, you had every opportunity to set a time, set a, an alarm, do something. Create the, 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 the circumstance that would cause you to remember that you need to pray. But you chose not to and then you, you engaged in something. That was inexcusable. That thing then caused you to forget. So it is true that you didn't pray because of forgetting, but it is also true that you forgot due to something that is not excusable, something that is the result of negligence. The opposite, yani if somebody, the time of the prayer came in, they were engaged in something that is from the responsibilities of the dunya and the akhirah or the akhirah and they got caught up in that and they lost track of time and then they realized, oh no, I missed the prayer. That is excused because you forgot due to something that is not considered by the standards of sharia as negligence. So al-khata'u wa nisyan 
that is referred to in this hadith, uh, mistakes, doing sins mistakenly or forgetfully, they are excused according to this hadith, but if they are not the direct uh, result of negligence, if they are, then you are held responsible, not because of, of doing the act forgetfully, but because of engaging in that which is a direct cause of forgetting something that you need to do. So, إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ تَجَاوَزَ لِي عَنْ أُمَّتِي الْخَطَأ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has lifted for me from my ummah things that they have done due to mistakes or misyan or forgetfulness. وَمَسْتُكْرِهُ عَلَيْهِ And that which they are forced to do. Any one is not held responsible for sins that they have committed due to being forced. Being forced again, according to Sharia, falls uh, into two broad categories. One is where you are forced to do something and you have no choice whatsoever. Not when we say no choice, what's it mean? Completely no choice. Sometimes people think we don't have a choice, but but in, in, in normal language, not in a technical use of the word choice, in the normal use of the word choice in the English language, sometimes you'll say, oh, I didn't have a choice. That word's convention. When we speak that way, this is urfi meaning. This is a conventional use of the word choice. So this is what I'm trying to, to uh, hint at when I'm talking here. So for the rest of, of this bit, do not interpret the word choice in the normative convention way. I'm talking about choice in a very technical sense. One type of force eliminates choice completely. That is when, for example, you do not have control over your body at all. Somebody else controls your body. So let's say, for example, somebody takes your hand and you have no control over it. Let me just use a simple example, but it's, it's not a probable example, but just to get the point over. If somebody strong lifts up somebody light, strong big guy took a little scrawny guy, like lift him by the legs and use him to beat somebody else. Very unlikely, but what I'm trying to, to convey here is the, the person who is not used as a tool for hitting, he has zero choice in the matter. That's what I mean. Choice in this case is completely eliminated. You were used as a tool. In this sort of scenario, you become like a hammer. You become like a stick. So there's no you share like zero of the responsibility of the harm done. So if you were used and, and the, the strong guy hit somebody else with you, and he got injured or, or died, you share no blame in the injury or the death of that other individual. Let's say, for example, another example, a bit more likely, let's say as a prank, let's say you're like standing on a balcony, something like that. And as a prank, your friends push you off the balcony. You fell off and landed on somebody in a way that caused them to die. Snap their neck. You landed on a baby, for example. The weight was too much. It result you were not to be blamed at all for that. Because your body was the, the thing that caused the, the direct result. But you were not the one that caused your body to produce that result. This type of thing by ijma of the ulama, somebody is not responsible for. But now there is force. I'm forced to do something. Not in that way. This is the second category. But in a way where I am threatened to do something. Here, choice is not eliminated. You're going to make a choice. In the conventional use of the word choice, yeah, we said I didn't have a choice. But in the technical use of the word choice, you do, you did have a choice. But you are choosing to avoid whatever you were threatened with 
to comply so that that thing that you are threatened with does not happen to you. In this case, most acts are excused due to force, according to Sharia. If somebody comes to you and says, if you don't do X, X meaning some sinful thing, I will beat you badly. I'll break your legs and I'll, you know, they go on. If, number one, there are conditions for, for this being a legitimate threat according to Sharia, for it to be considered force. If you believe that the person will, and you don't believe they're bluffing, if you believe they are capable, you know, somebody who is like a little wimpy person said, I'm going to beat you bad. And you look at, that's not a threat. That you're not forced by that individual. So you, you must believe they will carry through. You must believe that, you know, and when we say believe, believe in a reasonable sense, not in a paranoid sense, but you reasonable, reasonably believe that the person will, the person can, and that there is no other way you can get out of this. You cannot defend yourself on your own physically. You cannot defend yourself by seeking the aid of other people. You cannot report this to the authorities. You cannot escape. You cannot run away. You cannot. There literally, you couldn't have done anything to avoid the threats that you received. Under that type of situation, gun to your head, I will pull the trigger if you don't steal somebody else's property. That type of thing is excused according to Sharia, except in the Shafi'i school, except in two cases. One, uh, murder and zina, committing uh, adultery or fornication. For the first, according to the Shafi'i madhab, because... If it comes down to taking a life, the threat is you need to kill somebody. If you don't, I will kill you or I will kill a member of your family. Here, either way, either way, uh, a life that is sanctified by the Sharia will be taken. Either yours or the one that, that the person wants you to take. So because now it becomes equal, your life versus that life, a sanctified life is going to be taken. But you're the only one ha who has a choice here. If you opt to save yours for the other, according to the Shafi'i Madhab, that is sinful. There are differences of opinion among the fuqaha in general, among the fuqaha in the Madhab, and among the fuqaha in general, some people consider like, well, who is the life? And there are different levels and stuff like that. But according to the Mu'tamad of the Shafi'i school, it is sinful. So force in that case does not remove the sin. If someone did in fact kill so that his life will be saved or the life of one of his family members will be saved, according to the Shafi'i Madhab, being forced in that way does not remove the sin. And in the case of zina, committing a fornication or adultery, according to the Shafi Madhab, we say because it's not, majority of the ulama say because it's not possible to be forced into that type of situation. For the women, yes, but for the men, no. Because you need to have a certain physical quality and you need to have an erection in order to commit zina and under force majority of the fuqaha say in a case you're being forced to actually have an erection and go through with it is not likely because in order to have that sort of erection you must be feeling some sort of desire i mean in our times there can be that can be induced by different medicines it can be induced by different uh, introducing different substances to the body and so on. Later, ulama among the Shafi'i Madhab, Imam Ibn Hajar al Haytami, rahimahullah, and others say that it is possible to be aroused or at least have an erection in such a case under force. So, therefore, yani, it should still be excusable. So, the whole difference of opinion in the Madhab comes down to whether or not we believe someone can have erection under duress. 
So those who say yes, say, well, it's like any other type of force. Once we can establish the forcing, fulfill the conditions of being forced, then this also is like other sins. Some of the fuqaha say no, since they do not believe one can have an erection under such uh, circumstances. In the Hanafi and the Maliki schools, there are other examples, other cases where they uh, hold that zina under duress is, I mean, the sin of it is lifted because of the force. Anyway, these are just some differences of opinion related to the general meaning of the hadith. The general meaning of the hadith is agreed upon by the ulama, and that is that mistakes uh, not due to negligence, forgetfulness not due to negligence, and being forced. I mean, the sins committed under these circumstances are lifted, meaning the the ulama also differ what is meant by lifted in the hadith. Does it mean that the sin is lifted or does it mean that the hukum is lifted? This is a difference of opinion among the ulama. When we say it is lifted, are we saying the hukum, the, the legal ruling of prohibition is lifted? Meaning for that person in that particular situation, that person who is being forced or the forgetful person, the person who forgot, or the uh, person who's committing a mistake. In relation to them, in that particular situation, that particular instance, is the hukum of prohibition lifted, or it still remains a prohibition with relation to those individuals, except that the sin of committing those prohibitions are lifted. Meaning, the ulama differ on that, but the consequence is the same, which is the person is not held accountable for it. They are not held responsible for it on Yawm al Qiyamah. And then Imam al Nawawi, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, Hadith al Hasan, the hadith is graded as a Hasan hadith, and it was reported by al Imam al Bumajah and al Imam al Bayhaqiyu. Rahimahullah ta'ala and other than the two. Then we move on to hadith number 40. Inshallah ta'ala, if there are any questions on this or the previous hadith, you can, I don't know, keep them in mind, probably write them there. We will look at all of the questions at the end. Inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The 40th hadith. Imam al Nawawi, Rahimahullah ta'ala, wa nafa'ana bi reported through an unbroken chain of narration to Sayyiduna Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma who said akhadha Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallama biman kibay faqal the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam held my shoulders and said kun fil dunya ka'annaka gharibun aw aabiru sabeel be in this world as if you are a stranger or you are a traveler. وكان ابن عمر رضي الله عنهما يقول إذا أمسيت فلا تنتظر الصباح If you experience the evening then do not wait or do not expect the morning. وإذا أصبحت فلا تنتظر المساء And if you've experienced the morning then do not wait or do not expect the evening. وخذ من صحة لمرضك and take from your health for your sickness and from your life for your death Rawahu al-Bukhari and it was narrated by the man or is reported, collected by the man al-Bukhari radiallahu ta'ala anhu Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullahu tabarak wa ta'ala wa nafa'ana bi reported through an unbroken chain of narration to Sayyiduna ibn Umar radiallahu anhu that the Prophet وسلم, held on to his shoulders. We've spoken many times in the past concerning different ahadith that one of the mustahabbat and one of the things that are recommended in nasiha, in, in delivering advices and important reminders and messages to people is that you try to make it impactful and we've pointed out different ways 
in when we spoke about different ahadith in the past of the Prophet وسلم, doing this or accomplishing this. One of the ways is to touch people, is to create a physical sensation that can be remembered or to which the advice can be attached because this is how memory works. Different senses can register different memories better. So a lot of the times people can register memories through the sense of smell, through the sense of sight, through the sense of hearing and something that they heard. If you have a smell from your childhood, you won't only remember your yani the smell, you'll have specific memories that accompany that smell. When you smell something, hey, this is my grandma's the smell like my grandma's uh, food, and then you have a memory that, 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 that happened. Different things like that. So touch is one of those sensations that help to register memory. So the Prophet وسلم, he, he used that method of touching because he wants the, the message to make an impact. This is why in different narrations from the Sahaba, عنهم, we saw that they would relate the hadith along with their memory of these moments because they registered the memory, the message that was delivered by the Prophet وسلم, was registered in their minds along with these little things that happened. So when you read the books of hadith and many times you see qala, 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 the Prophet وسلم, said, he said, he said, he said, and then you'll come across, we were here one time on this. We saw this thing one time. There was a sound one time, like that, right? The Prophet ﷺ came and he smelled like. These were different moments. Why, why are they reporting this? They were not instructed by the Prophet ﷺ that when you're going to report a hadith about me, tell them, there's no instruction where he told them, tell the circumstances, report the smells. He didn't say that, report. They are the ones reporting this, which means these were some of the things that the Prophet ﷺ did that registered with them. The rawis of the hadith, the narrators of the hadith, they're making the choice to convey these things along with the message. Because in their minds, in their experience of that event with the Prophet ﷺ, they felt these were also important, not just the message delivered. So Ibn Umar is narrating a hadith. He begins that narration by telling us the Prophet ﷺ didn't just tell me this. He held on to my shoulders, meaning grabbed my attention. There's a moment that we had. He wanted this message to sink in. He didn't just say it to me. He made sure he grabbed my attention and then he told me. From that part of the hadith, the fuqaha, the scholars of fiqh, have mentioned that it is mustahab, not only permissible, but recommended by Sharia ah that a teacher, a parent, or a murabbi, a teacher, that's clear, a parent, or a murabbi, meaning somebody who is in charge of tarbiyah, he's in charge of the uh, refinement of someone else, he's in charge of the moral refinement. And, and the ethical refinement of somebody else. It is permissible for those people to touch the bodies of the person under their care in parts that is halal for them to touch, in a way that is halal for them to touch, in order to convey important messages or in order to convey uh, make it more impactful or to show love or something like that. So automatically it's not wrong for a teacher to touch a student on the shoulder, something like that. Of course, male and male, female and female, all of those type of things have to be factored in. But the mere touching is not wrong according to Sharia. And one of the things that the Fuqaha pointed out with that is as long as that kind of relationship exists between the two. Ibn Umar 
رضي الله تعالى عنه is no stranger to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. This is somebody he knew from birth. This is somebody who had a certain relationship with him. But the fuqaha pointed out that if you don't have that kind of relationship with your student or with your somebody who's new in your care and something like that, then it is not, yani the istihbab doesn't apply to you, the, the recommendation doesn't, repl- doesn't apply to you because you might cause more harm than good. You might elicit a reaction that you are not expecting, especially if you don't know the backgrounds of people. Not everybody likes to be touched. Sometimes touch can trigger certain things in certain people. Uh, unsolicited touch it depends on their backgrounds and all of that. So, yani, it's not a blanket recommendation based on the hadith. I mean, the hadith is, is a report between two people who had a certain type of relationship. So, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa held uh, onto my shoulder. And said, "Kun fi dunya ka anna ka gharibun aw abir sabi." He said, "Be in this world, live your life in this world, as if you are a stranger, or you are a traveler." Now, a stranger and a traveler are two different states. So, is the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam saying? Be one of the two? Is he saying be either of the two? Yani what, is he, what is he saying? Or is he saying be one? The ulama differ on that based on the, how we interpret the word aw in the sentence. So, kun fi dunya ka'annaka gharibun. Be in the world as if you're a stranger. A stranger has more comforts than a traveler. So I can be a stranger in a, in a new place. I go to university, for example. I'm a stranger, new student in the dorms, but I have a dorm. I have beds, I have furniture, I have certain comforts. I have access to certain things, right? So a stranger has a certain level of comfort that is higher than that of a traveler. A traveler won't be traveling with his bed maybe a sleeping bag or something, but not a whole bed. You never go through an airport to see a guy with like a fridge on his back. He doesn't have that. A stranger in a place may have a fridge to cool his stuff. So it's two different levels here. So what is the meaning of the word aw? Is the Prophet wasallam saying, be in this world as a stranger? Any, uh, sorry, yeah, as a stranger. And better than that, yani, aw, yani, or if you can, yani, if you can do even better than that, then awabiru sabil, then be as if you are a traveler. Is he saying be be this? Yani, this is good. Don't don't go lower than this. Lower would be meaning don't operate like you are here forever. That, that this is a permanent situation. That this is the life of this world is meant for your comfort and, and, and for you to become like don't so he's saying don't do that be as if you're a stranger and if you can even do better than that and be as if you're a, you're a traveler and even if you can do with less luxuries in this world and have the mentality of somebody who's passing through in order to get back to a different location which will be the akhirah then do that but if you can't do that, if that's too much, then at least be as if you're a stranger. So that can be one way of interpreting the hadith, and that's one way in which the ulama did in fact interpret the hadith. Another way would be to interpret the word aw as bal, which is possible in the Arabic language. So kun fi dunya. If we interpret the hadith in this way, then he is not saying one of two states. He's not saying either of two states. He's not saying, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, be a stranger. But if you can do better, then be as if you're a traveler. The meaning of the hadith becomes one, be as if you're a traveler. 
The other one is just to point a paint a picture. So when you have that picture in your mind, then say even better than that. It's like somebody saying, hey, do you know X, Y, Z? You say, yeah, yeah. So once you have that in mind, that he said that as a standard. If, so, for example, somebody is uh, doing a particular thing, any particular studying, exercising, something like that, and you bring to their minds, like especially you're conditioning children, for example, bring to their mind somebody who they, 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 they idealize. Because you want them to picture that, but you don't want them to settle for that. You want them to imagine the best thing, that, the best reference that they have, but then you want them to top that. You, you're talking to young men, for example, who, who want to excel at a certain sport. Let's just say basketball, for example. And, and you're, you're their coach. You're training them every day. Hey, and they're shooting, say, hey, like LeBron, right? You know how LeBron does it? Le LeBron does this. This is how he eats. This is how he trains. This is discipline. This is what he does. That, you know that? And then you get in your mind, yeah, I want you to be better than that. Your point is not say, don't settle at, at that level. I want you to be better than that. I want you to beat that. So you're conditioning them not to settle at what they think is the best. You're conditioning them to beat what they think is the best. In other words, you're conditioning them to be the best. So according to some of the ulama, uh, this is what the Prophet Sallallahu is doing here. First he was saying, Kun fi dunya ka So that picture of a stranger comes to mind. So I'm um, Stranger, I have very little attachments. I don't know people that much. I'm not settled into the community. I don't have a lot going on. Uh, I don't have a lot of luxuries. My mindset is not that I'm here to stay. I'm just here for a little while. So why would I invest in the best of luxuries? So that comes to the comes to your mind, right? You, you just function. I'm just here. Let me just get what I need to get by and then move on. Once that picture is in the mind of Ibn Omar, Anhu, the Prophet then said, Bal. Yani, aw, according to some of them, means Bal. So, Bal, Abiru Sabi. No, no, no. Once you have that picture in mind, no, no, no. Even, even better than that. Don't be as a stranger. You got that picture in your mind? Okay. Be as somebody who's traveled. Not even somebody who's settled in a place and is unknown and unfamiliar. Be somebody who's not even settled in a place. Take on the mindset of somebody who's just passing through. Because if I know I'm here for four years, it's a different mindset from if I know that I'm just passing through. If I'm here for four years, I might invest in certain things. I might invest in certain luxury stuff. Not too much, but just enough to be comfortable. But no, if I'm just passing through, I don't go to a hotel and fix the leaks. And I don't go and like change the carpets because I don't like the color. I don't go into a hotel and buy a bigger fridge. You don't do any of that. You're just passing through. Why invest in those things? So according to some of the ulama, the real meaning of the hadith is be in this world as if you're a traveler. The first part of it, as if you're a stranger, or just to bring something in his mind to then you know, transition him to something even better than that. And of course, the message of the hadith is not a fiqhi, message. This needs to be understood clearly. When the Prophet is saying to Ibn Umar anhu, kun fi dunya, this kun in the Arabic language is a command. It's in, it's in the imperative form. It's in the Arabic language we have the verbs can either be past tense, present, present tense or imperative. It's a command. But not every command is for obligation. Imam Subki rahimahullah ta'ala the in his general jawani a book on usul al-fiqh mentioned 26 different implications of the imperative form of verbs in the Arabic language so it's, it's not always for obligation so people cannot read this hadith and say it is wajib for me to live as if I'm a traveler and they can't use that hadith and go to people who've invested in different luxuries in their worldly life to make it comfortable. They can't go to them and say, you're doing something haram. The Prophet ﷺ commanded us to be as if we're... That's not what is happening here. This command in the Arabic language, kun fi dunya, 
is a command of advice. It is not a command of obligation. He's not saying be. And if you're not, you're sinful for not being. So it's an advice. The Prophet is advising Ibn Umar and by extension his ummah to not get too comfortable in the dunya. Don't treat this world as if it's a permanent place. Don't spend all of your energies and your resources, whether it's physical or mental or spiritual, don't spend of yourself and of your wealth to, to treat this dunya as if it's permanent, as if you have to have every comfort here, as if you have to eat every beautiful thing here, as if you have to know, as if, oh, if I... If I don't get the, these things in this world, I'm losing out and I will never know. Don't do that. If you lose it out here, you gain it in the akhirah. It's not a, if, oh, if I don't eat a certain level of food here, if I never experience a certain type of luxury here, I'm going to lose it. No, 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 no. Lahum fi dunya wa lana fil akhirah. Let them have it in the dunya. Let we we'll have it. Said, be, be hungry in this dunya in preparation for the feast of the akhirah. Somebody went into the house of Abu Darda عنه, and he didn't have much in his house. And, and bear in mind that back then not everybody had much in their house, right? In terms of you talk about furniture and stuff in houses, back then, we're not talking about what we're talking about now. I mean, poor people now have more furniture than rich people back then. So you can imagine when it's, when you can make a comment on it. Somebody went into Abu Darda's house, didn't have much of the furnishings that usually would be in homes back then. And they asked him about that. And he said, uh, we're not intending to stay here for long. And then the person said, okay, but for the while that you're here, you want to be comfortable. And he said, the landlord doesn't want us to be too comfortable. And what he meant is, we're not here in the dunya for too long. And by landlord, and you can't ca call Allah Azza wa landlord, he didn't say that. In Arabic is Malik, and Malik could work as a name of Allah Azza wa The translation, no, so... I shouldn't have even said that. But, but that was the meaning that he wanted to give. That the owner of the home doesn't want us to do much. And so the, the person he's speaking to, the immediate meaning is, oh, the, the person, you know, when you're renting a place and you're in your contract, you can drill, you can do this. You, what he meant is Allah, Azza wa Jal, the owner of this home and the owner of everything, didn't intend for us to stay here for too long. So why should I invest much in, in that? And again, this is not a fiqhi thing. This is not, this is not sharia. I mean, this is advice. This is not sharia. We can't go tell people that buy sharia, any, you're going to die soon, so don't buy carpets and don't buy water heaters and don't buy a fridge. That's not, that's not the message. Right? And that and there's no faqih in the history of Islam who said that those things are haram or even makruh. So there's a difference between there's a recommendation to train your mentality. Your mindset should not be one of somebody who thinks he's going to be in the dunya forever. Your mindset should be there that at any moment this can all be over. And then what do I have when it's over? That's the mentality. That's the message. To constantly ask yourself, what do I have? What do I own now once this is over? And Imam Al-Ghazali said, he's famous for saying that what we own is that which cannot be taken away in a shipwreck. Meaning the human being, the content of our characters, the content of our hearts, our knowledge, our a'mal, those are what we own. Anything else that can be lost in, in, in a disaster, you don't own it. Because what happens? If you really own it, it's a part of you, then what happens when it's destroyed? Is a part of you gone? If people make who they are, the things they own, then every time you lose one of that, are you losing a part of who you are? 
as the, the world we're living in now values people based on what they have. And so they make people thinking that in order for me to grow as a human, I must have more. If, if I don't have a certain item, it means I am less as a human person than somebody who has that thing. And this is the message the Hadith is should know. Because what happens when that thing is gone? People who think I am, I am somebody because I have an iPhone. I am somebody because I can wear certain brands. I am somebody because I can live in a certain type of house. I am, you, you get the point? The Mercedes is who I am. The BMW is who I am. I am of this, my value as a human, because I have this extrinsic. No. What happens if it gets into a crash? What happens when you lose your money? What happens when anything happens? Well, if the economy crashes and then everything followed by a natural disaster. So everybody lose their money and then everybody lose the things that they had. Then what do you have left with you? If you were all those things, then what are you now? Valueless? Are you a nothing? Are you a nobody as a human being? But invest in the things that make you more as a human being. When all of those things are taken away, do you have kindness? Do you have mercy? Do you have patience? Do you have knowledge? Do you have wisdom? Do you have intelligence? Do you have kindness? Do you have empathy? Do you have... Those are things that cannot be taken away. Invest in those things because in the place that you're going, that you're traveling to, those things have value. Not the other things. When you show up in that different dar, that different place, that akhirah, you show up there. The things that make you valuable there are those other things that you didn't put much time into here. And the things that you put a lot of resources into here that you've acquired means nothing there. Nobody goes to a higher place in Jannah simply because he didn't drive a Proton, but he drive, drove a BMW. It doesn't happen. You don't look up in the Akhir and see somebody at a higher level in Jannah and say, oh, because he had a BMW. He didn't. No. It doesn't, make, it doesn't work that way. So that's the message of the Hadith. So we're not saying any of those things to acquire them in a halal way is impermissible. What we're saying is the mentality of a believer is that this is not permanent. And so I should focus on that which is valuable in my journey to Allah. And anything else that can that is not necessary in that journey, that can weigh me down in my journey, the same way in a real journey, I don't carry on my back that which I don't need, I only pack the things I need to make that journey lighter and better for me, those are the things you take with you to the Akhir. So it's a mentality, it's a, it's a mindset that the Prophet ﷺ was communicating to Ibn Muhammad Al Imam al-Bukhari after reporting the hadith from Ibn Umar, then reported Ibn Umar's statement where Ibn Umar communicated what I got from the hadith. Remember we said what was communicated in the hadith is a mindset. Ibn Umar indicated that immediately after in the narration of Imam al-Bukhari. What did Ibn Umar gain from that hadith? Imam al-Bukhari said, وَكَانَ Ibn Umar رضي الله عنه يقول Ibn Umar then used to say, إِذَا أَمْسَيْتَ فَلَا تَنْتَظِرُ الصَّلَاةِ That is what he got. That's the mentality. If you've experienced the evening, do not expect the morning. Don't think that you're going to be in this dunya forever. And if you've experienced the morning, then do not experience, then do not expect the evening. That is what he gained from that hadith. That the Prophet gave him a mindset of, I'm a traveler and this journey can be over at any time. There's no permanence here. And the thing, the ulama say, the, 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 the main, yani, People who, who have that mindset of, I'm not here for long, they benefit from three things. And people who, three main things. And the people who do not have that, they suffer from the opposite. So the three things is, number one, people who think that in the morning I may not see the evening are people who hasten to make toba. They don't think, oh, 
I'll make tawbah Friday, I'll make tawbah in Ramadan. When I make hajj, I'll make tawbah. No, I'll make tawbah now because I don't know what happened if I'll see you this evening. And people who think they have a long time, they delay tawbah. The second he said, they say is that people who are not expecting to live long are people who are satisfied with enough. What do I need more if I don't think I'm going to be here for too long? People who think, oh, I'm going to be here and they picture their whole lives, they just, oh, I need this, I need that, I need the other thing. People are in their 20s thinking, oh, but when I'm 80, I might need this, so I need to like stock up on it now. Who told you you're going to see 80? Be grateful for what you have now. And people who, you know, the third thing is, People who uh, think they do not have long are motivated to do good deeds. Because they know the Akhirah is soon. And the only thing that matters in the Akhirah are good deeds. And I only have this limited amount of time to do it, and I, then I better get on that now. And I, I need to stop doing all of the extra things that, that I don't need. But people who think they have a long time, they, have, they, they treat their time with a level of fluidity. Oh, what are you doing now for the next time? Oh, I don't know. Oh, let's see. They get on their phone. They, they have no idea of what they're doing. WhatsApp, whatever they do, Instagram. I mean, I don't know what they do. And then two hours pass, like, what have you accomplished in the past two hours? Oh, nothing. Oh, but I know this guy said that. This other one said that. This person posted that. This person posted their breakfast. This person had that for the, you know, this person went here, that person went there. Because you're just scrolling through people's feed. Okay, what have you accomplished in the past two hours? Nothing. Because you approached it with a level of fluidity. But if somebody said, okay, I got to check my messages, I allot 10 minutes to that. Yeah, you check the important ones. The ones you realize are not important, you scroll through them, you don't even bother with it. You get the messages you need for the day, you're done. Structure. For the next 10 minutes, I'll do X. For the next 15 minutes, I'll do Y. For the next two. So you're not treating time with a level of fluidity. That oh, I'm going to do this. Then whenever that's done, I'm going to do that. Whenever that's done, I'm going to do that. I'm going to go here. I'm going to go there. No. You don't have much time. You have to prioritize. When something, an activity, and it's going to take time, but not going to give you much return. And then you're after that. You need to cut it out. Not even like, just cut it out. So that's the message that was given. They're motivated to do much, and people who don't have that are not motivated to do much because they think, I always have the time. The, the, the threat, what the psychologists refer to, the threat of the promise of tomorrow. I'm not going to accomplish today because there's this pro tomorrow presents these opportunities, right? The time, but you don't know because you don't know what will happen tomorrow. You can wake up with a headache and all the things that you could have done today that you left for tomorrow, you leave it what? The promise of the next day. Oh, tomorrow. And then if you're in this constant tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. When you look back six months past, you didn't do that one thing. Because it always you, you're living in the promise of tomorrow rather than the opportunity of now. And so this is what Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu understood from the hadith. And then he said, وَخُذْ مِنْ صِحَّتِكِ مَرَضِكِ وَمِنْ حَيَاتِكِ مَوْتِكِ And take from your sick, from your, uh, your health for your sickness. When you're healthy, take opportunity. So that when you're sick, you don't have to lose out on things. And from your life or your death. And that one is clear. Live in the dunya because it matters. What you do here matters in the after. And... The ulama say based on that hadith also that, not based on that hadith, but that hadith supports a meaning that they got from other hadith, which we spoke about in the last session, and that is if you're accustomed to doing something, any good deeds, and it's your intention to do that, but you're prevented by something beyond your control, then you get the rewards of the, of the intention. People who are accustomed in Part of where Ibn Umar said, Take from your health for when you become sick. Some of the ulama say what it means is accustom yourself to good deeds. So it becomes your habit. 
so that when you get sick, you still get the reward of doing those acts. Because now you, you, your lifestyle, you're living a certain thing, and it is your intention to continue doing that. When you become sick, you're prevented from that normal thing that you do, the normal good deed that you do, because of a reason beyond your control. And, and if that's the case, you'll get the rewards of the intention. You'll get the rewards so you don't lose. When you're sick and you can't do what you normally would do, you get the rewards of doing what you normally do. Because of the hadith that we mentioned in the previous lesson from Sahih Muslim, حَبَسَتْهُمْ أُذْرٌ or مَنَعَتْهُمْ مَنَعَهُمْ أُذْرٌ That an excuse beyond their control prevented them. But they who share with you, شَارَقُوكُمْ فِي الْأَجْرِ They share with you in the rewards. So that's the meaning of that. And then in the next session, we'll look at the next يعني, hadith, inshallah ta'ala, هذا وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين والحمد لله uh, thank you so much, Sheikh, for the enlightened session and reminding of our reality of life. Okay, we are now in the Q&A session. So those who have questions, you may turn on your mic and ask a question directly or you may put in a chat section. I believe we have one question here, Sheikh. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Can you please elaborate on the first hadith? regarding the love of human beings towards Allah and Allah's love towards human beings. I believe this referred to Hadith 38 by uh, Sister Putri Sarah here. Yeah. So the, the love of human beings for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ulama say that what that refers to is their obedience. So among the ulama, there are those who say that we interpret the word love from humans to Allah Azza wa Jal in a way that is not zahir, in a way that is, meaning we, we remove from the apparent meaning, the apparent linguistic meaning, to a different shara'i meaning. So they say that love from human beings to Allah Azza wa Jal or from the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, human or not, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is obedience and acting in accordance to his will. Al Imam ibn Hajar al Haytami rahimahullah ta'ala and others say that there is no need for ta'wil. There is no need to shift from the apparent meaning to the less, uh, to an implied meaning, because it is possible for us to mean when we say love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we mean actual emotional love. The same way somebody can say, I have this deep thing that I feel inside of me that I express with the linguistic symbol L-O-V-E. I have that for my child, for my wife, for my parents, etc. That then I also feel internally something like that, that I designate the linguistic symbol L-O-V-E to, towards God, that nothing prevents that. So mahabba or hub from our end to Allah Azza wa Jal, the ulama, in at least some of them say that there's no, no reason to not interpret that literally. But it can only be real or it can only be acted upon if it, you know, the way to act on it is ta'a. The way to act on that love, to express that love, has to be in a way that is pleasing to Allah Azza wa so, so they say that we don't shift from the apparent meaning of love to ta'a. What we say is love is there literally, but ta'a is the expression, is the proper way of channeling or expressing that love. But love from Allah Azza wa Jalla, to the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to be interpreted. There must be ta'wil. Ta'wil technically means to shift from an apparent meaning to an implied meaning. The reason for that shift is the impossibility of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having emotions. And the impossibility of Allah azza wa jal 
being affected by that which is other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Being ilah, being God, in transcending all dependency, in transcending all uh, deficiencies, and transcending all change, and transcending all qualities that are only possible for created beings and in all things that are contingent, where one thing is contingent on a cause, all of those, because Allah Azza wa transcends those, then necessarily, because of that impossibility, we have to interpret the word love from Allah Azza wa to mean something other than an emotion. Because if it was an emotion, then Allah Azza wa is subject to change, and Allah Azza wa can shift into different states, and Allah Azza wa can be affected by His creation, which are all impossible for Allah Azza wa So the love of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for His creation is Him rewarding them, and Allah Azza wa having the will to reward, the will to give, the will to increase in his giving towards them, his will to increase in his tawfiq for them, in giving them, willing for them to be more obedient so that they can get more rewards and so on. Yeah. Uh, is there any other questions from the audience? All right, if there's no more questions, uh, Thank you so much. Uh, we would like to request uh, Brother Sheikh to lead us in the dua to close our session for today. جزا اللهم عنا سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم بما هو أهله جزا اللهم عنا سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم بما هو أهله جزا اللهم عنا سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم بما هو أهله اللهم اغفر لنا ما قدمنا وما أغفرنا وما أسررنا وما أعلمنا وما أنت أعلم به منا أنت المقدم وأنت المؤخر لا إله إلا أنت اللهم طهر قلوبنا وأزل عيوبنا وتولنا بالحسن وذلنا بالتقوى واجمع لنا خيري الآخرة والأولى وارزقنا طاعتك ما أكنت من الرحمن الرحيم اللهم إنا نسألك كل خير سألك من وعدك ورسولك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ونعوذ بك من كل شر استعاذك منه عندك ورسولك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم اخر لأمة محمد ويسر لأمة محمد وارحم أمة محمد وأصلح أمة محمد اللهم ردنا إلى ديننا ردا جميلا لا عذاب فيك ولا إطار اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين الحمد لله رب العالمين أمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. عليكم السلام ورحمة الله أمين أمين الله ما أمين الحمد لله وانا سعيد. We like to thank Sheikh Masoud and all the audience who attend today's 40 Hadith Series sessions. جزاك الله خيرا كثيرا. But before we end our session today, uh, on behalf of the other organizer, Medina Institute Malaysia, we'd like to inform of our new event, the Book of Love series. Uh, this session will be based on the Book of Love written by Sayyidi Sheikh Dr. Muhammad bin Yahya Aninawi. And it will be led by uh, Ustaz Muaz Kalla of Medina Institute Cape Town. Inshallah, we will start the first session by 2nd February. Uh, it's on Tuesday. Uh, 9 to 10 p.m. Malaysia time and 3 to 4 p.m. South Africa time. Check this chat session. Okay, are the previous recording available for reference? Uh, I think uh, Umran TV already uploaded in the uh, YouTube. Um, let's all maybe we can promote that in the Instagram and Facebook. 
All right. So may Allah bless uh, Shay Mas'ud and all our shuyukh, Umran TV, for all the technical supports and all the uh, audience that came today. Please forgive us of all the shortcomings throughout the event. And don't forget to follow Medina Institute Malaysia Facebook page and Instagram for the latest announcement uh, and upcoming events. Inshallah, see you in the next session. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.